Hello, welcome to another episode of the Ancient Warfare Magazine podcast. In this episode, we're going to be discussing the concept of death and dying in the ancient world. It's thanks to Vim, who uh, one of our patrons, uh, who suggested the topic. If you do enjoy the podcast, why not become a patron of the of the uh, show? Throw a throw a shekel or two in the virtual ball each month. We do try to give something back to our patrons who get to watch us record live. And Murray has been recording some bits and pieces exclusively for patrons. So to find out more, have a look at patreon.com slash ancient warfare podcast. So to get to the main feature, uh, joining me today are Yes, Brotage, Murray Darm, Mark McCaffrey and Mark DeSantis. So the concept of death, dying, killing, uh, how is it uh, described and perceived? Murray, um, you had some thoughts which might kick us off um, thinking of, of great deaths. How, how important was it to die to die well? Well, I think the, the ancient world has a whole pile of great death sort of obsession, if you like. I mean, probably on... Leonidas, King Leonidas at the Battle of Thermopylae is one of the, the sort of the most famous great deaths of, of a, not just King Leonidas, but his entire bodyguard. But when you start to spread the net wider, you've got lots of uh, anecdotal and historical accounts which concentrate on the deaths of, of heroes and warriors, you know, all the way from the Iliad onwards um, and in both Greek and Roman contexts and not just military ones. So, you know, when you look when you look at the Iliad, the Iliad is mostly about killing and quite gory, you know, the the, the sword point passing between the third and the fourth ribbon coming out the shoulder blade and, you know, eyeballs getting stomped on in Julius Caesar and and all sorts of uh, amazing well, that was a job. imagery. Well, just I'm, I'm trying to be inclusive of the entire period, uh, you know, that there's there's. Uh, there's accounts of great deaths, you know, and, and even Ammianus Mycelinus has people dying at the siege of Armida in such a crush that they couldn't, the body couldn't fall over because there were so many people around them holding the body up, you know, and Aemilius Paulus being skewered by so many spears that he couldn't fall over, and that's repeated in several battles. Um, Kynagerius at the Battle of Marathon, who gets his arm chopped off, holding on to the prow of a Persian ship. And it sort of sails off with his with his hands still attached. Um, there's all of that, you know, and that's just off the top of the head. All of those imageries about great deaths exist throughout um, the ancient world, and they're not just military. You get domestic death as well. So you get anecdotes of Seneca's death, um, and also uh, Petronius, you know, robbing Nero of the of the chance to kill him. Uh, all those sorts of defiant deaths is one of my favorites is a little bit obscure which is uh cato's daughter who swallows hot coals rather than be um is that cato's daughter no someone swallows hot coals rather than be tortured so she basically kills herself by eating a hot coal which is just the most horrible so it, uh concept it, it, it's no, the nature no, it's, of the it's, death it's, that, that you liked rather than who it was. <laughs> you can't remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Porkia. No, sorry. It's, no, it's, it was it's Porkia, Porkia. But no, no, I don't. I think Porkia's is different. I think that, that was the freed woman Epicarus in the, again, in the reign of Nero. Ah, Porkia's um, death. Um, uh, you know, this is just me, me quickly Googling. This is not something I had ready. Porkia's death has been a fixation. This Wikipedia, so. Uh, uh, has been a fixation for many historians and writers. It was believed by a majority of contemporary historians that Porcia committed suicide in 42 BC, reputedly by swallowing hot coals. Modern historians found this tale implausible. An amazing story. Yes, but I sorry, think the, you know, no, I did, well, I'm glad I was, shouldn't have doubted myself. Um, the, the fact is that those sorts of, images of death and you know and we, we then we have sculpture because you've got from the very earliest parts of greek art the most identifiable uh motif when when you know geometric art starts to have not just a funerary scene which you can't actually give any specificity to clearly i'm awake because i can say specificity i even repeated it um you've got the death of patroclus uh and uh, Ajax carrying Achilles' body. Those are the two most identifiable sort of anecdotes. And you start to get, you know, lots of death elements, the death of Penthesilea, you know, the, the, the dying Gaul gets copied not only um, in sculpture, but then, you know, the Romans copy it all over this 
over the shop. So there's a, there's amazing um, moments within Greek and Roman history where the death and the act of dying is the thing that's focused on, not the you know not the life up to that point, not the heroic anecdote where anyone escapes. It's kind of uh, you know the death. And, and again, when you look at Greek tragedy um, and Roman tragedy, it's all about death and the you know the the unes- inescapable. Uh, trauma that leads up to the death, even when some of them have death all the way through. <laughs> and becoming a god. Does it matter if it's a crap death? <laughs> Do they have to be great deaths? I don't think there's too much emphasis on ignominious deaths. Um, That's a much better way of putting it. There's a couple of there's a couple of really frustrating things in Herodotus where he tells us he's going to talk about the death at the Battle of Thermopylae again, for instance. He says. I'll I'll return to the death of Ethialtes later, and it's one of only three unfulfilled promises he makes. You know, one's being the history of Assyria, um, but that's quite like oh, that's unfortunate. You know, and, and I mean even even um, yeah, I'm just trying to think of ignominious death. Well, yeah, Nero because he can't kill himself, having it done. M- Mark Antony. Mark Antony gets the whole, uh, you know, missed with the with the dagger. Have another go, sort of go. So yeah, and I suppose Caracalla, uh, you know, murdered in his bath by, a, yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, Agamemnon. Mm. Oh yes, yeah, uh, uh, well, I don't know. If you, <laughs> can you call that ignominious, or is that is is it playing a, is it playing upon other th- themes that you know overtake it? So. Well, I mean, that's, that's always the that's you know the fact that we're now we're 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 naming some people who are not necessarily entirely well without blemish. Um, you know what what's is that just cherry on the story of sort of he had it coming. But there's even some enemies that really get a, a good death still. I've been doing a lot on um, looking at the Catiline conspiracy again recently, and Catiline gets his death, you know, even after everything that Cicero has said about him and all the uh, you know, bad stories that he dredges up and whatnot, still Catiline is said to, at the end, show all these good qualities in the final battle and run into the thick of the enemy and die with all wounds on his front. And so, given this glorious death, even though he's up until now been, you know, demonised in every possible way. Yeah. Well, that's that's a fabulous segue into that, you know, that obsession as well. That the the wounds in front, you know, we've got stories of uh, Africanus, you know, stripping off in the in the Senate to show all the wounds in front, um, which is another sort of, you know, even if you haven't died, you've you've shown the quality of that. That if you had, you would have died in the most manly manner possible because your wounds were all in front, um, and you therefore hadn't run away. And that again, that anecdote goes from the earliest Greek lyric poetry onwards throughout the Roman and Greek worlds. And we've got a couple of um, there's there's uh, is it is it is it Ovid 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 has one, and there's um, oh. Oh, I can't remember his name, the spelling. But there's two poets who make the opposite point of I've run away, but I threw away a shield, but it doesn't matter, I can just buy me another one. Um, but those, uh, those yeah, two... Archilochus. <laughs> Archilochus, that's it. That's, there you go. Oh, no wonder. Um, those two contrast with, you know, the rest of the material, which is all about, you know, don't step backwards, stand in the battle line, um, you know, and, and face front, and don't be afraid of, you know, war's spears and shafts. So... Even even if you're not going to die, the whole anecdote is, and the whole sort of attitude is that you need to be facing the front, um, you know, and that's again that's very consistent throughout uh, the ancient world, really. In, in, in relation to that, we have one possibly one of my f- favourite questions we had we had sent in from from Facebook. How did the ancients distinguish between brave self sacrificing death in battle? And being a bloody idiot that wastes his life. <laughs> That's a very interesting question because the Romans actually had a, uh, a, a ritual by which they could sacrifice, a, a general could sacrifice himself, go knowingly 
uh, to his doom, but do so for the benefit of his army. And it was called Devotio. Uh, what he would do is, is that, uh, and, the, and the instances of Devotio uh, come from the uh, Republican period, especially the early uh, Republican period. And um, it, essentially what the, uh, the, the, it was and more or less contained to one family. Uh, Publius Decius Mus was a uh, consul who, in uh, it's uh, 340 BC, there's a battle uh, in the vicinity of Vesuvius, and the Romans are fighting the Samnites. And uh, Mus says uh, the battle's not going well, and there's a ritual which he has to perform. He calls over the uh, one of the uh, Roman priests, and he says, uh, "Tell me what the ritual is." He stands on his spear. He uh, devotes both himself and the enemy troops to the gods of the underworld. And the idea is that by doing something so dramatic, so uh, so self-sacrificing, so noble, that the victory would be given to the Romans by the gods. And then he charges into battle and he's felled by the enemy army. But the Romans uh, win the day. And uh, the Devotio was also employed by uh, another Publius Decius Mus at the Battle of Centinum in uh, 295 BC, in which the Romans also uh, won the battle. Yeah, you wonder, you wonder if that anecdote's invented after they won. I don't know. It's, it's strange, isn't it? Um, but it, fit, it, it fits a pattern, though, because it, just, it basically matches the idea of going from you know, Romulus onwards with them vowing their temples or vowing their shrines. And it's just an extension of the of that religious practice. So whether you can sort of class it as, is this a death? Um, it, w would it be uh, seen as or viewed as by the Romans a, a death that reflects on the individual? Or is it more, uh, you know, just the, ex would they just be saying it's the extension of our religious practice by a serving priest? Yeah. I think so. You, I think you can maybe turn the question, uh, answer the second part of the question, or turn it around maybe, is that if you're going to do something really stupid on the battlefield, you better make sure you die. You know, don't, don't go and survive a battle that you caused to be lost because you were an idiot. Livy himself, after reporting the stories about these two instances of Devotio, uh, undercuts his message about them by saying, you know, the, the Romans pretty much were already winning or they won without. It was actually the general on the other side, the consul on the other side of the battlefield who uh, really you know, won the day. So he's uh, he's relating the story and then also telling you that there was a, an actual bedrock reason why, you know, tactical reason why the Romans won. But, but it's a fascinating story because uh, the, 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 that the Romans had apparently a ritual for this, which, uh, as I said earlier, required them to stand on their spear and recite a, an actual litany that he needed the, um, I want to say he had to call the pontifex over to him uh, to, uh, to, to help him uh, recite the, uh, the prayer uh, to the gods and then went on into battle. And now, now mind you, these two instances date from the uh, early Republican period where just so much of Roman history is, is it's, 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 if you want to call it semi-legendary embroidered legend, there's a lot of things in there that, uh, don't strike me as being a hundred percent, uh, historical. I, I think we had a, a long time ago, we had an article in ancient warfare where somebody tried to, uh, let's see if I can easily find it. I think he tried to, um, prove or sort of discuss what would happen if you, you know, say that such a consul devoted himself and just crashed himself horse and all into the enemy battle line because that would break up the line and therefore maybe cause a, um, an opening for the Romans to exploit. Corona Ray, yeah, there. Consular suicide, issue four, five. Okay. It's only been seven uh, yeah. years, if well, I remember. But I think it, it, it's funny, though, because I think it is, it's very much the sacrifice aspect that's emphasized, not the idiocy aspect. You know, even, even at the Battle of Cannae, you know, double envelopment was all going well, according to the Roman idea of battle, because the Roman legion was going forward and the, the you know, the Carthaginians were pulling back. So that's technically it was great, but it was it was leading into Hannibal's trap. So 
um, that. But you know, you get you know Horatius on the bridge. Um, you get you know someone like Domitius Corbulo falling on his sword. You know what a pointless and utter point. But that's emphasised for its loyalty. That that you know the emperor who was jealous of him demanded that he fall on his sword, and he did so. Like Stilicho presenting himself for uh, execution when the uh, executioners came for him from uh, Valentinian the Third. Yeah. How do you think attitudes? I mean, do you think these attitudes to death <laughs> affected the battlefield? Affected the way the battle might have might go? Or, I mean, are they almost constructs to try and affect? The, the the real battlefield these uh, i guess uh, if we call them stories they you know i don't know if that's the way to call them i think so and i think the fact is that when you look at their legacy they they're still with us really um you know you look at you look at poems of well even war movies um you know they still inspire some young men to to love military history who may or not be speaking right now but you know you know charge of the light brigade there's there's all sorts of poems since the ancient world that have bought on that idea of, of inspiring great death stories and being soldiers and dying on the field of battle the right way. Uh, so I think absolutely that's what they were about. Um, and that, yeah, I think they probably are a literary construct because I think the reality of battle, um, not having ever been in one, but I think the reality of battle is probably far messier and far less heroic than, than the literature tells us. Um, but the way that, even 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 veterans sometimes build the the image of what happened on the battlefield is is a literary construct or a, you know a, a memory that's made to fit um, and it's only really very recently you know probably since the face of battle that that's begun to change and some you know war films has tried to show exactly how chaotic and, and horrible it is but um, most most still buy into the the great death, you know, and you can you can go into a pub and start talking about great movie deaths of warriors, uh, and they'll start you know raving about how oh it was great it was awesome oh you know, which is not not the truth of battle at all. But uh, they're certainly pushed into the face of the Romans though as well because if you consider that there's it going into the forum in Rome and you know, watching any speech or what not being given from the rostra. Uh, during the Republic, there would be across the rostra uh, various statues that were placed there commemorating people who had died in the name of the Republic. And even though they sort of get overshadowed in the last uh, century of the Republic by figures of Sulla and uh, Pompey and one other. Um, they're, they're, they're still they're still there until the the imperial they change the the uh, uh, the viewpoint of the forum in the imperial period, but it, it's being shoved in the face of everyone. It doesn't have to be said to anybody. It's there, in, you know, for all to see. Mm. Well, even even walking into um, you know into Athens, you go through the Karamakos, and most of those deaths are uh, probably heroic, you know, battle deaths. Even if they weren't, you know, that's that's the story that's going to be told about that tomb and that person and that tomb and that person. Um, you know, and even 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 the you know, the, the walking into Pompeii, for instance, you've got the same thing. The the road is lined by tombs of, of great individuals. So that whole sort of idea of talking about the the great death in battle of that individual is brought up by having their tomb and their sculpture displayed because that's part of the anecdote you talk about that person, you know. We've got others, but it's unlikely that the great story of oh yes, he reformed he reformed the grain law is going to be told um, about X Y Z as opposed to you know the one in Pompeii where the, the 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 tomb is actually a bench seat. I thought was the most amazing. Come sit on me and remember my life. It's a, I, I was just thinking of uh, 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 of how religion and beliefs uh, to death might affect the battlefield and it, you know, it, it, it struck me that things like the banzai charge you know of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the second world war you know are, are, are done under the understanding that you're going to go somewhere else there's all kinds of religious um connotations and connections you can make pinpoints you could pop plop in the map going back in history where people did these sort of heroic things based on the fact that they that death was a just a somewhere where you want to be can we see these kind well, of um haven't we discussed it recently that you know for the romans and greeks generally 
It's not that much the case, unless you manage to magically make it into Elysium. It, it's more likely that you're going to end up in um, in uh, uh, limbo, uh, if you're a Roman, in terms of saying, right, well, it's a violent death, and by violent death, you, you know, that's where they get some of their ideas about ghosts who uh, are lingering because of the violent death has not allowed them to, uh, you know, go from one to the other. For, for, for the ancients and maybe in general, the, the afterlife doesn't seem to be something they're very focused on. But I'm, so maybe therefore they're more interested in making sure that if and when they die, it's memorable so that people at least talk about them. That concept um, of Gloria, really, you know, you know, Gloria and Farmia and those sorts of things that, yeah, you'd be talked about and you'd be remembered. Those are sort of dominant, but you do get a you know you do get a lot of obsessions you know again in Greek and Roman epic with traveling to the underworld, and they always meet warriors who've died, um, you know both Odysseus and uh, Aeneas meet meet warriors and things like that. So um, there is that sort of religious aspect to it, I suppose, and there is that there is again there's that. Uh, semi-religious devotio that, that, that Mark was talking about. Um, so there is sort of a religious aspect to sacrifice, even even pointless sacrifice. But then, you know, you think about decimation, uh, that's pointless, but it's not. It's viewed as discipline. Um, and, and, you know, the... the, well, the that, that's a perfect segue to uh, this book. Mm. Oh! What, what's that book? Uh, Listeners yeah, won't be able to see it. Oh, come on. I thought we figured that out by now, how we do that <laughs> podcast. It's John Lennon, Soldiers... John Lennon, not Lennon. <laughs> Lennon, Soldiers and John Ghosts. John Lennon! <laughs> uh, yeah, he wrote about the ancient history too. Um, and we've discussed it before, but the point he makes for the Romans, warfare is a constant sort of push and pull between the two concepts that Murray just mentioned. You know going for your own your personal fama and glory on the one hand and the required discipline of the unit on the other um, it's certainly not not a book that's um, you know there's been pushback but um, certainly an interesting and pretty convincing argument that he makes well I think again the you get the emphasis by certain uh, anecdotes where you know I'm going to be the disciplined general, and then the it's the father, the the general, the general's son who's the one who breaks ranks and does something, and so the idea is I sacrifice my son, Brutus sacrificing his sons. You know those anecdotes of of the glory of the state is above family glory. Um, you know again to us we read those as horrific, pointless, you know uh, infanticides if you like, but they're posted by the Romans as, no, no, this is this is glorious dedication to state. Um, I, 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 I made a note of a question which I think is nonsense that I dreamt up, which was how, you know, how is a death for the average soldier, which I, I guess no one ever writes about the death of the average soldier. No one's interested because it was probably, you know, not heroic. But um, Abraham on Patreon, Patreon, you know, uh, sort of almost builds on that by saying, with a de do we know if there was designated grave diggers or morticians to prepare bodies for the uh, for, for for soldiers? You know, do we know how they how the dead on the battlefield were treated? We get uh, in again. I think in in, in is it Catiline um, where Sallust describes the sort of the horror of the battlefield because because it's a civil war you get people turning over friend and enemy at the same time that they know uh, and we get you know we get Tacitus describing the the, the discovery of several battlefields where they're, they're just bones and they've been left to lie there so the implication of that is obviously there was no no one left alive to actually bury anyone so they didn't get buried um, that was that was what happened in the Tudorborg forest disaster that is uh, Germanicus came upon the remains of the uh, Roman soldiers who had not been buried, uh, obviously because the Romans were all destroyed. And I think you know you do get you do get anecdotes of the desecration of the dead. Um, you know the Scythians cutting heads off and 
you know. But then, you know, the ancient Egyptians would cut hands off to prove how many kills they'd gotten. You know, we've got sculptural and uh, literary depictions of, of warriors proving their worth by the number of hands they'd chopped off for their for their king and their pharaoh. There are a few Roman tombstones where it's mentioned. I mean, um, Marcus Calius is, of course, the most famous one. But that tombstone it specifically says, if you ever find me bones, you can put them here. Uh, there's a few other ones where it actually says this so-and-so died in battle um, there and then and there. And presumably he was buried in, at that tombstone in that case. Um, uh, the Adam Clissi uh, monument in is it Romania? Um, isn't that a mass grave? There's a mention um, in Pausonius about going to the Battle of Marathon. You, of course, you've sort of got the, the mound of the uh, 192 uh, cavalry from Athens being buried on the battle site. But then Pausonius makes the observation of uh, when he visits the battle site, supposedly, saying it's noticeable that there's no graves for the uh, Persians and that he can't, he can't ascertain what happened to the Persian dead. And sub uh, I believe sub subsequent there has been archaeological digs around and excavations going on that have uh, basically supported this idea of saying it looks like probably Persian dead were just piled into mass graves at that point. So in, in terms of just like a clean-up job rather than any, um, you know, respectful, you know, taking care of their needs as such. Well, there's the great, there's the great honour of, of being buried on the field for both the Plataeans and the Athenians, isn't there, at Marathon and, and the Theban sacred band at Chironia. Um, and, we know, and we know that the Chironia, under the, the Lion Monument, the, the graves, they were very strictly laid out, um, which which is sort of emphasis to honour, um, which, which ties in with what Philip's saying uh, in the accounts of the battle. But I think for, yeah, I, I, as, in terms of, there's no, there's no word for grave digger in any military context, I don't think. In there's a, there's the foss, fossil, fo, fossa in the um, Latin, but the, it mainly, it's not to do with the military, it's to do with um, civilian, because you've got lots of evidence to do with Rome in terms of there was a um, out, outside of there's outside of the gates of Rome there is a community at the grove of uh, uh, Libertina which is basically the grave diggers and morticians and uh, the uh, stretcher bearers basically I can't think of the, the term um, and they are all uh, they're all forced by law they must live outside the city um, and because they're tainted and they can only come in they if they come into the city they must wear there's a red cap and a, there's some sort of other uh, brightly colored clothing they must wear this inside the city and ring a bell anywhere they go but there's the there's the support for that community in, outside of Rome there's likewise a description of the same sort of community outside of Naples um, or Puteoli near Naples, um, but they're the only two definite um, descriptions of these communities, and it's assumed that it continues in the, across so the you, world. You could postulate that those sorts of communities would send members as camp followers on yeah. military campaigns, couldn't you? Really? Yeah. Um, or if the, if it's near a, a you know if there's a city nearby, you'd assume that maybe those those people would be called upon to you know go out to the the battle site if it's within a vicinity or interesting mm. yeah but there's no there's no military diploma that reforms a I, I haven't it, or to be seen a, anything a, a fossiarius would it be a fossiarius or something yeah, i'm just looking like i've that? got the uh, domazewski <laughs> die rangordnung des römischen heeres here i mean, I mean if it's if it's a thing it's going to be oh, in it's, here it's a, i can look it up now cuz i've got it here We've got we've sent Jasper to the to the bookshelf and Mark to the to the uh, 
Now, now, if you are the Kindle version, you could just type it in. You'd be there yeah, rather the, the, rather than <laughs> us having to watch people flick through books. You, you and your Kindle. There is, <laughs> sorry, there is nothing. There's nothing more inspiring than the than the uh, burrowed brow of a forehead deep 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 in a book. I'm sorry, that's just. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, was, I thought you were going to say that. There's nothing more inspiring than the old Germans, uh, you know, thorough old Germans about researching their their Roman history. You can't beat them. You can't heft a weighty term, uh, a weighty tome, and exercise your bicep with a Kindle. You know? It's not even that heavy. The, 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 your average modern iPad is heavier. So, so, so I, I suspect by the fact that neither of you have, fa- uh, have found anything. <laughs> no, I don't think I've found. I, I don't think it's in there. Okay, uh, Undertakers. Here we go. Um, among the fur- funeral specialists, this is I'm quoting from Valeria, uh, Valerie Hope. Uh, Roman death. Uh, For those who could afford to employ them, undertakers may have taken substantial costs. Libertina was the goddess of funerals. She was not worshipped, but she was associated with a grove outside the Esquiline Gate, where items and services for burials could be purchased or hired. Among the funeral specialists were Polytores, who prepared the body. I believe that comes from, um, it is based on the smell that uh, was associated with perfumes that they put they applied. The Vespalones, who carried coffins and corpses, the Fossores, who dug graves, and the Ustores, who cremated bodies. Uh, they were all for, also flautists, tibicines, uh, horn players, mimes, dancers, dirge singers, the Profice, and mourners for hire. The designato might also organise and direct proceedings. Same as being found in Puzzoli uh, and Kumai. Right. So, so those, yeah. So those are domestic, and we might assume that they follow the army, but they're not. Yeah, they're all uh, urban mm. uh, ideas, basically. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I think it also extends to ex- the executioners um, were lumped in with the same group. They also had to live in like an exiled community outside of the of the city gates and uh, as well as that exiled community what is interesting is that when you sort of then look at what else was outside of that gate you also get the basically the roman equivalent of plague pits outside of that gate for basically these guys were re- responsible not just for attending uh you know nice funerals but they also seem to be the guys who sweep up the unwanted dead bodies around the city, uh, which you know of the of the lower classes that aren't able to um, you know pay for funerals, and they get rid of them outside the plague pits uh, in the pit, in the pits, which by the time of Augustus are smelling so bad that uh, Mycenaeus actually ends up building his gardens over the top of them because he has to bring in. 13 foot of um, soil to put on top of them, basically to seal them off, and then build his gardens on top so that nobody is actually going to build a building over it. So, Well, as we're talking about specialists, we did have another question from Ellis, who, who, who uh, you know, queried who was designated torturers that we uh, read so much about in uh, in novels but never actually get any, any information on. Or is that because they didn't exist? I don't think we. Yeah, I don't think we have any evidence of of torturers. Um, and like you know, armies and memorial. I don't think they uh, emphasised that that was anything that they did. Um, yeah, I mean, there's ah, oh, there's there's again. Well, except you the go, Assyrians, of course. There is a description in Livy, isn't it, during the early Republic of the execution? I can't remember who it was that tied to four horses and um, ripped to shreds, although then they sort of ban that from then on because they reckon it's too gruesome. I think, I mean, there is there is uh, the Dolonea in um, the Iliad where, where Diom- Diomedes and Odysseus essentially torture um, Dolon in no man's land of the, the Trojan War, um, you know, and promise him all sorts of things if he tells them where... Uh, Achilles' horses are, which he can't, so he says, no, 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 there's better horses by Rhesus. So he tells them where Rhesus is, um, 
and they go, yeah, yeah, great, and then they chop his head off, and then they go and kill Rhesus and take his horses. So there is, there, you know, which is, again, that's kind of appalling, but at the same time it's emphasised for its uh, trickiness because it's Odysseus being tricky. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, but there's all there's another mythical tie-in for that as well. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm just trying to remember other... Because there's no, there's no extraction of information in the pulling apart by four horses. It's just... No, it's yeah. just punishment. It's punishment, Ex execution not... Execution detail. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think most of the punishments we get recorded are not necessarily to find things out. They are to punish for things done and therefore, you know, you have to suffer this punishment. Do, do, don't they have... Don't they have a... Um, don't they have a torture in that... Uh, I'm sure it was in that documentary, The Life of Brian. <laughs> Um, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, so I think, I think the answer is A, we don't know, and B, we don't know <laughs> to that. <laughs> is it likely that somebody ever did tell us or else? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting that it's come up as a fiction, you know, I guess it's a modern fictitious construct, but you know, that, that we're perhaps we're placing on the past. But it's an interesting one that it does, it does come up all the time in fiction, you know, the, the role of the torturer, um, uh, which must be a more you know, presumably medieval or something. On well, unless they maybe we just, you know, the, 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 the team here is just not aware. There is, in terms of Roman slaves, there's the mention of torture in terms of if, if a slave is brought before a um a court that it's supposed to they're supposed to be tortured standard. otherwise you're not sure that they're going to be telling the truth hmm. but i don't know i don't know that there's any specifics of labeling exactly who's responsible for that or if it's just i'm not sure not not what civilized people do so it doesn't get written down and it doesn't fit into their uh, idea of themselves is that why we have no evidence? Uh, no, that, I don't think you, you can... Making a, a, an argument ex silencio is always very difficult with uh, the ancient world. There's just <laughs> too many gaps. To the, when it comes to the Roman law courts, it's the speeches of the, you know, the uh, lawyers like Cicero that you get. And it's, they, unless they, there is a purpose to it, then they're not going to mention the the ins and outs of the normal procedure of court. Shall we move on to what I guess is the uh, second sec, second part? Of the, you we've been looking at death, dying, and killing. You know about capturing. Uh, you know if we're, if we're talking about our four on the battlefield, um, what about what about capturing our four? Is a is a historical evidence of uh, ransoming uh, captive enemies like we see in the Iliad? I can think of one uh, uh, instance of uh, an enemy, or excuse me, a prisoner who was ransomed back by the Romans or exchanged somehow. Uh, that would have been uh, Cornelius Scipio Asina, who was the commander of a Roman squadron in 260 BC. He was uh, lured into a trap in the Lipari Isles by the Carthaginian fleet. The, uh, his squadron was captured. He was uh, well, the, the squadron fled. All of the ships were captured. He was captured by the Carthaginians. But we find him as the consul of Rome several years later. So the supposition is is that the Romans and the Carthaginians had some form of prisoner exchange going on during those years. It was an extremely long war, lasting from uh, 264 BC to 241. So it would make sense that there would be this desire for to get your own people back by exchanging prisoners you, you had taken. Uh, dating from that same war, the First Punic War, there is the story of Marcus Atilius Regulus, who was one of the victorious uh, uh, commanders at the naval battle of Echnomus in 256 BC. He also then took command of the Roman army that was landed in uh, North Africa right after the battle. Uh, he... Uh, came up to Carthage and started demanding, uh, made exorbitant demands on the Carthaginians uh, when they came out to have some sort of uh, negotiated settlement. The uh, Carthaginians decided to fight. They hired also a uh, Spartan soldier by the name of Xanthippus who whipped their army into shape. And 
were led by Xanthippus, the Carthaginians defeated the Romans. Uh, this would have been uh, 255 BC, defeated the Romans and took Marcus Atilius Regulus prisoner. There is a story which uh, I, I think is of dubious uh, of, uh, authenticity, but this is the story as it exists, that Marcus Atilius was allowed to return to Rome as part of some sort of uh, peace negotiations, and he told the Romans, do not uh, make any sort of peace. And then in fulfillment of his uh, promise to return to the Carthaginians, that is, uh, he, you know, this is Roman honor that we're talking about, he goes back and the Carthaginians execute him. So there, is, there are those two stories of uh, relatively uh, famous examples of uh, prisoner exchange. Uh, but most prisoners, of course, become booty and therefore, you know, fit to be sold as slaves. Mm. Well, we do get the anecdote of uh, Caesar, of course, being captured and ransomed, but he escapes. Um, so, you know, there's this... There's, there's capture and I think there is capture and ransom, but it's not emphasized much, is it? Um, so it's it's an, an, an economy to war, so you can either capture people and ransom them, or capture the people and they've got booty. You know, they, they've got they are they are booty. They, they have a value as slaves. Um, and I wonder, I wonder, at what point then do uh, people fight a battle to capture booty, or do they you know fight a battle to slaughter? Well, and now we're going to get into uh, the argumentation about whether Rome was purposely, uh, especially the Republic, it was an economy that was driven by conquest and therefore by the booty that you get from conquest, which consists for a very large part from of slaves that can that you can sell and that can help the economy further and. Which puts the idea of killing your enemy, uh, you know, not necessarily as a first thing on the agenda. Winning is obviously first thing on the agenda, but then if you can capture your enemy, you, you, you have those, a fiscal those, prize. Those same reliefs that Murray just mentioned um, uh, from Egypt and uh, and the ancient Near East that have you know you, you have a, the post battle scenes where you have stacks of hands or ears or just piles of bodies. On those same reliefs, you see long columns of prisoners being taken, um, uh, undoubtedly to, to become slaves. So, you know, you prove to be manly by killing them, and um, you improve the economy by capturing them. <laughs> Does that mean people don't write about capturing tens of thousands of slaves uh, because it's not necessarily uh, manly? Well, there's that story that um, Julius Caesar basically destroys the economy by capturing so many slaves in Gaul that the slave market is kind of flooded, um, that, that they're, they're slaves are to a penny kind of thing, to a denarii or whatever. Um, I was just thinking also, you know, at the, at the end of uh, the Battle of um, Sphacteria, the, the, the Spartans do uh, ransom their 120 um, homoioi. Uh, so you know there, there is there is evidence of it, but it all points to status. I'm sure the Athenians were would have been aware that those homoioi were going to be uh, very valuable bargaining chips, essentially. Yeah. Whereas at you know at the end of the Sicilian campaign, tough luck. You all you know they're captured, but they aren't. Yeah, but there's you know there's thousands still thousands of them, and then you have to ship them back to Athens and. If Athens even wants them anymore. Uh, another question from one of our uh, patrons, Bronwyn, he wonders if there's any evidence or reflections on mercy killings for wounded or crippled soldiers. Other than Alexander the movie. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, mercy killings. Uh, I can't. I can't think of any mercy killing off the top of my head. Wonderful. We've we've completely stumped ourselves. We haven't even got gone up very go off left field with something to get round the question. <laughs> we have we have done that wonderful politician no. thing of asking answering the question you wish was asked. We've, and we've done that. We've done that. We've done the horrible politician thing of dead air of just sitting there staring, um, going. Oh, yeah, but that's because we trust in Angus going snip. Yeah. yeah um, uh, but tumbleweed. I can't think of anything. 
Uh, yeah, I, 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 I can't think of a mercy killing. I can't think of a mercy killing that um, is either described or even that we would re, or even that we would reinterpret as a mercy killing. You know, in the in the gladiatorial arena, you have uh, slaves who come on and ensure that the gladiators are dead. So there is, I suppose, in that sense, if they're very badly wounded, they will come on and kill them. Yeah, but that's with um, a red hot poker. That's not exactly that. Yeah, but it's <laughs> well, no, well, exactly. But the, the but the emphasis there, <laughs> the emphasis there, is on the gladiator not faking their death rather than mercy killing or, or uh, yeah, anything kind. But it's it's it is put pointed out as as a, uh, appropriate. But then the same thing, you know, with gladiatorial death is that we have all these tombstones of gladiators who lose fights. You know, I won 23 fights, lost eight. You're like, hang on, hang on, wait, whoa, 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 what, lost eight? How is this possible? And, you know, our, 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 our concept of, uh, of gladiatorial combat always being a, um, someone dying is just not true. Um, and the number of, you know, the number of tombstones with the amazing um, forgiveness or... or um, uh, mercy hand gesture, which then gets adopted by uh, Christian um, iconography. So that that is a, a gladiatorial uh, thing. You get you know those wonderful tombstones, and there's just a hand coming out of nowhere, not pointing a gun, but you know forgiving, um, because that would be clearly a, a, anachronistic. But um, that that sort of there is mercy, and we've we've got it in the thumbs up, thumb down perennial debate that we've got it wrong. So that's more that's more mite, like you know, send them back to you know to fight another day. It's not it's not the mercy that we would interpret in the modern world as such. I was just wondering, could we include um, the the scenario that Josephus describes when he's besieged and with when he's um, down the well with these companions, and they decide they're they're very questionable suicide. Pact. Is that can that be considered a mercy killing? And Masada, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. But again, I think the way that that the way that that's emphasised is heroic. Um, you know, heroic death, not 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 uh, suicide. You know, it's it's we rob them of their victory. Um, yeah. I mean Spartacus too. You know the fact that the fact that they can't identify the body of Spartacus um, is bizarrely emphasised in the sources Actually, as a way that, of. Uh, uh, reminds me that the. Um, I don't know if this was normal procedure, but you know that in the Christ story, the um, the poking in the liver. Or the spear is often interpreted as a as a mercy killing. If you're not already dead after hanging there for a couple hours. Mm. There's also there's also Nero. When there's the story of Nero, you know, when he's decided that everyone's against him, and goes to his um, gladiator friend, is it Milo? No, am I saying the wrong name here? Asks for help. No, it's not Milo. Um, it's but he asked for help in terms of killing himself, and the the, uh, the help is not forthcoming as such. He uh, he refuses a mercy killing at that stage. Mm, mm. But again, I think that's part of the ignominious death, isn't it? Really, that's how yeah, low he's, again. You know, mm. he's shrunk. But see, again, you know, the 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 suicide of um, Cleopatra isn't regarded as. You know, it's it's a it's a heroic death, if you like. Um, There's also the August Augustus's own death, in one version, is a uh, well, again, it's not a mercy killing, but it's not uh, not quite, but it is a you know assisted suicide by his wife because his plans have not been fulfilled because he's all of a sudden got better, um, but it is I don't know, it's as close as you can get. So have we have we covered everything that we had on our checklist? Anyone want to add did anything? Did we answer did we answer all the questions from Facebook and Patreon and any any other? Uh well, the only potential one we missed was how severe is the plague in Athens during the Peloponnesian War? 
to undermine them, how much population recovery to contest Spartan hegemony? It was very serious. The, uh, yes, the, yeah, the, uh, I, I think we should stop at it was very severe. <laughs> I, I would I would say that's about as succinct as I can make it. Uh, one approximately one third estimate of the total population of Athens was felled by the plague, which first appeared in 430 and then returned returned again in 427. Uh, the, the estimate of one third is based upon the report by Thucydides that roughly one third of the hoplites of the hoplites of Athens perished. Uh, the Athenians also lo- lost, I think, maybe one quarter of their their cavalry. That is the, the, the people who actually could serve as horsemen in their army. So it was an extremely uh, and, and uh, the most famous victim of all of the uh, uh, plague was Pericles himself. Here's here's what I think. If we were going to say, well, what was the effect of the plague on Athens? Is that it was very damaging, and it certainly hurt them during the war. They were nevertheless able to hold on and win in, I would say, the the first phase of the uh, Peloponnesian War, the Archidamian War, as it's called. One of the things about Athens is remarkable is that their their not only their staying power despite the plague. But also the fact that they were able to rejuvenate themselves. Uh, you know, people uh, then grew up and came to uh, manhood and staffed their armies. Uh, so that by the time that the uh, Sicilian expedition was being contemplated and undertaken in 415 BC, uh, it was almost as if the the plague had not. Uh, I don't want to say that it hadn't occurred, but it certainly had not slowed them or kept them, um, made them more conservative in their ambitions. Uh, their, their, their ambitions were still very uh, large, and they undertook the uh, attack on Sicily, which ended in disaster. So what I would say about the plague is, is that it, it hurt very badly, but it didn't keep the Athenians from ultimately engaging in self-defeating uh, behaviors that ultimately brought them to ruin many, many years later, obviously. So that would be my take on it. Possibly the worst thing that happened with it was actually the effect on the political landscape of Athens in terms of the the change of direction that, that came about because of, you know, l- the losing of Pericles. And if you, you know, you look later on the, the rise of the, the new demagogues. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the loss of Pericles' vision was probably the biggest effect of the of the plague, but then you know there are there are plagues in in the Roman you know, the the plague of one sixty five is regarded as one of the worst, the one that Lucius Ferris brings back um, from um, See, Parthia. And, and this is why you should uh, never ever go emperor. They just mm, mm. you know, and they're very common. You know, whenever an army returns from a foreign campaign, they generally bring a plague back with them. So. Uh, so do you think we've do you think we've do we think we've flogged uh death dying and killing enough? <laughs> Should we uh, we, uh are, we out of, are we out of steam? J- Jasper, what, what what are we talking about next time? What's the uh, next issue of the magazine about? You caught me off guard, you <laughs> rotter. Well, you, you, you usually manage quite successfully with Guy, who always takes by surprise when you ask him what his magazine's about. He never did remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, it's true. It's because, you know, I, we, we as editors, we tend to be already on the next one, and they're like, yeah. Um, no, issue 12.3 is about to return from the printer, and it is, um, it's about armor. Um, this is the first time ever that we came back to a topic that, that we'd done before, but I figured it's... Um, when did we do armour? I don't recall us talking about armour. Uh, well, it was issue 1-3. Ah, that could be why. Maybe we, maybe that's just before we started, so we might never have Does, talked about armour. Didn't we, I thought we, did, we, didn't we go back at the, after, in the first year, we, we went back uh, and uh, we discussed uh, Agricola and daily life and armour in Spain? Ah, uh, maybe, 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 maybe. So what, what, what articles are in it? Uh, we got quite a few. We have a, a, an article about um, well, the very first type, you know, early experiments with armor. Uh, we have a couple things looking at the male armor of the Celts, um, whether it came from the Celts or not. Uh, we have an article about how the Roman army adapts to meeting different enemies. Uh, we have a, an article about late Roman 
armor supply, arms and armor supply, how they how the Romans arranged that, or, or as far as we can see how it works. Um, uh, we have uh, an article on the Battle of Turin, where the Clibonari, who are of course the like the ultimate armored warrior, one of them anyway, of the ancient world, gets defeated, and um, as a kind of a metaphysical armor, uh, uh, an article about magical protection about the Roman army. Um, it, it, it kind of appears that if you want to be a, a good reenactor, you shouldn't just have the right kit. You should be probably be covered in all kinds of amulets and, and potentially some flowers, although Caracalla didn't approve of that. I was thinking about, I, I thought about having a, a, an illustration done about that, but I thought maybe <laughs> And uh, if people don't already subscribe to the magazine, where can they subscribe to the magazine? Uh, www.ancient-warfare.com <laughs> So there you are. Go buy the magazine, read up on it, and pump us with questions. Better still, not only buy the magazine, but become a patron of the podcast at patreon.com slash ancientwarfarepodcasts. So that's it for now. Thanks to uh, Jasper, Murray, Mark and Mark. I'm Angus Wallace, and thanks for listening.